Would you be surprised if I told you that modern lifeboats have actually killed more people than they've saved? Well, it's a statement that's thrown around a lot, and while it might not be backed up by real life data, it does make you wonder where it came from. Frustratingly, there is no comprehensive set of global statistics, so we have to rely on a few small studies, like the one that the UK's MAIB published in 2001, which stated that since 1989, there were 12 fatalities and 87 injuries caused by lifeboats, compared to zero successful evacuations. While that should lend truth to the claim that lifeboats have killed more than they've saved, you have to remember that it only takes one successful evacuation of a cruise ship to turn things around. Say, the evacuation of the Sun Vista in 1999, where over a thousand people were evacuated safely in her lifeboats. That one didn't make the MIIB statistics, as it wasn't one they investigated. Still, it does make you wonder, why are lifeboats so dangerous and what can be done? In the early days, lifeboats would be lowered down the side of a ship into the water where a crew member at each end would unhook the falls so that the boat could get away. It worked fine a lot of the time, but there was a crucial weakness. The boat had to be in the water so that the buoyancy would take the load off the hook before it could be released. In any sort of a seaway, the boat would be jerking up and down and sailors would frequently lose their fingers while trying to release the hooks. Eventually, in 1980, there was an even worse disaster when the accommodation rig Alexander Keeland collapsed. There were plenty of lifeboats, but people were killed because the boats never floated sufficiently to release the falls. The solution was to mandate a different type of hook that could be released even if the boat was still hanging on the falls, an on-load release system if you like. The most common design is one that has a hook with a long tail, to give it a big lever, held in place with a semicircular cam. When locked in place, the force from the hook is geared down due to the lever and the point force is applied to the cam close to its pivot. It's an ingenious use of the physics of forces, which is obviously why I'm so interested in it and actually what led me to partnering with this video's sponsor, Magellan TV, a documentary streaming service founded by filmmakers. They host a rich and varied range of content covering space, physics, technology, health, nature and science history. I've recently been watching Jim Al-Khalili's Guide to Life, the Universe and Everything, which is a Magellan original production by one of my old university professors. He's passionate about science and exploration and is brilliant at really bringing physics to life. His infectious enthusiasm is actually one of the influences from my life that led me to creating this channel to share my passion for the maritime world. His documentaries on Magellan TV are just one small part of the 15 to 20 hours of new content that's added every week, so you'll never run out of things to watch. Magellan TV can be watched anywhere, anytime, on your TV, laptop or mobile device with compatibility for Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, Google Play and iOS. An annual subscription is only $59.88, so you only pay $4.99 per month for over 3,500 hours of documentaries. Click the link in the description down below and you will get your first month for free so that you too can watch Jim's documentary and the rest of Magellan TV's science collection. Anyway, we were talking about the length of this hook and its point of contact on the cam close to the cam's pivot. Essentially, it means that you can apply a massive force to the hook, say the weight of a lifeboat fully loaded with 150 people, yet you can hold it in place with a tiny force that stops the cam from rotating. Then, simply allow the cam to rotate and the hook will release itself no matter how much weight is applied. The rotation of the cam is actually controlled by this lever, attached through a length of Morse cable. Move the lever, and the cam rotates. You can even just attach a second length of Morse cable to another hook and you can release two hooks simultaneously. Brilliant. The onload release mechanism means that even if the boat is in a swell, applying massive force to its hooks, we can still release it. But the downside of course is that the boat could also be released if it's high up in the air, well above the surface of the water at a height where no one is going to survive the fall. You need some safeguards in place. A simple pin through the lever does help as it makes it a conscious two-step process to release the boat rather than one. But that doesn't stop someone from releasing it in a panic, say a high stress situation, maybe like your ship is sinking. So we can add another layer of checks. This time though, we'll make it a hydrostatic interlock to make sure you can't release it unless some part of the hull is at least touching the water. We just need a membrane on the underside of the hull that moves a pin inside the locking mechanism via another Morse cable. Add an indication pin behind a break glass screen in here too and we have a way of overriding it if it's really needed. You would have thought that would have been sufficient but accidents still happened. 
hydrostatic releases could get clogged up after a drill and stay in the unlocked position, even when the boat was hoisted up. Operators, often confused by different colour coding between manufacturers, didn't always pick up on it. Other accidents happened when the hooks weren't reset properly. On the Ho Duke in 1992, there were six fatalities and six hospitalizations when the cam didn't reset completely. The small angle meant that the reaction point between the cam and the hook was further away from the cam's pivot, exerting a greater force on the Morse cable, eventually leading to its failure and the boat's release. Aside from all the mechanical failures, there were also procedural failures, like the plexiglass coming away and operators not realising the interlock shouldn't ordinarily be touched. All in all, accidents kept happening so another solution was needed. The industry settled on adding FPDs or fall prevention devices to every lifeboat as well. I've seen a few different ones in use, ranging from a strop that runs from the boat to the hook at the end of the fall wire, through to a manufacturer modified hook with a pin that physically locks the hook in place. Basically, an FPD bypasses the onload release mechanism entirely, stopping the boat from being released. It needs to be removed completely before a boat can be launched. FPDs do stop boats from falling, but they add another level of action that's needed before you can launch a boat in an emergency. It's one of those things where technology was developed decades ago, but it proved to be incompatible with the human nature of making mistakes, especially under pressure. Yet, rather than rethink it completely, additional layers of action have been added to try and break the link between human error and an accident occurring. The procedure has gotten more complicated, increasing the need for proper training and education. But, is while conducting that training and education that accidents occur? In the time of the Titanic, people died because there were not enough lifeboats on the ship. Today, we have plenty of lifeboats, but people are instead dying while training. If you find yourself on a ship needing to operate a lifeboat, my plea to you is just make sure you know exactly how it all works on your ship, as every ship is different.